네, 저희 바로 키노트를 진행을 하도록 하겠습니다. 저희 키노트 제목, 키노트는 이제 어, Improving Force Security라는 어, 제목으로 키노트를 진행을 할 예정이고요. 어, 캐노니컬 시큐리티 팀에서 오신 어, 마크 에스라님께서 바로 키노트를 진행해 주시겠습니다. 네, 박수로 맞이해 주시기 바랍니다. 굿 모닝. 아, my name is Mark Esler. Uh, I work for the Ubuntu security team. Uh, each week my team patches a range of vulnerabilities uh, across the Linux landscape. Uh, my goal is in this talk is to uh, share that experience so that free and open source uh, software projects can improve their security. So uh, there's a lot of background terms uh, that we need to define to talk about security. Um, one is uh, upstream and downstream. Um, there's several definitions for this, uh, but I will refer to upstream um, as software uh, that other projects are dependent on. In the context of security, uh, if there is a security vulnerability in upstream, uh, software down the stream uh, will likely be affected. Downstream software is always dependent on the upstream software. Uh, upstream and downstream are relative terms. So in the case of node SQL8.3, uh, they are downstream of SQLite uh, and upstream of other projects that use node SQLite 3. Uh, and Ubuntu is downstream of every package that we maintain. Uh, the person who brings attention to a vulnerability can have various roles. Um, there's a lot of terms. I'm going to use a lot of them interchangeably, even though they're specific terms. Um, a security researcher is a person who primarily, who primarily looks uh, for security issues. And reporter and discoverer are broader terms uh, to describe the person who is bringing attention to a vulnerability. But I'll use kind of all three together. All right. Thank you. Uh, another term is backporting. Uh, backporting is where uh, parts of a new version of software are applied to an older version of software. Um, so uh, in this example, if we were to take um, a patch uh, for the new version and apply it to the older version, uh, the, new, the old version of the software wouldn't build. Uh, so what we'll do is we will backport the patch. Uh, often this might mean uh, just changing the comment syntax so that it fits, um, but it also might mean uh, moving functions around um, and, and applying other things. Uh, regression um, is a type of software bug, uh, which is created when um, you add a feature or you attempt to fix a bug. Um, uh, when security patches are made, uh, we're very on guard to make sure that we're not introducing new regressions to our code. Um, so what is a vulnerability? Um, it's important to remember that not every bug is a vulnerability. Uh, a vulnerability is any computational flaw that weakens the security of a system. Um, this is a very broad term, um, but you can use uh, common weakness enumeration, or CWE, which classifies different types of vulnerabilities. Uh, and this is defined by uh, the MITRE Corporation, uh, and they have a website with um, hundreds of different CWE types. Um, if there's a vulnerability in your code, uh, you should look up the CWE classification so you can communicate that with others. So um, what is uh, a CW or a CVE or a common vulnerability and exposures. Uh, the CVE program is the orga organization in charge of cataloging uh, vulnerabilities as CVEs. Um, CVEs are the primary source of data to describe vulnerabilities, uh, and they d contain a lot of information, including, um, most importantly, a description, reference, severity, and a CWE. Upstream developers and projects will use CVEs to communicate vulnerabilities to their uh, users and stakeholders. And then downstream groups will use CVEs in various ways, such as tracking the security of packages. 
CVSS is a way to calculate the severity of a vulnerability. It is included in the CVE to convey the priority and how the vulnerability works. CVS CVSS scores are not perfect. Uh, they do not always represent the vulnerability well. Uh, but nonetheless, we need some type of uh, relative scoring, and CVSS is broadly uh, adopted. The CVE program is sponsored by the US federal government and the MITRE Corporation. Often, uh, the CVE program and MITRE are confused, uh, but essentially, they provide the same data. So uh, if you're looking at this graph, there's a few spikes in the number of CVEs that are reported. Um, before 2005, um, the CVE program's board uh, voted and vetted every CVE that was assigned. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, MITRE was allowed to begin assigning CVEs. And then in 2017, certain trusted organizations like Canonical uh, could become CVE numbering authorities or CNAs and also assign CVEs directly. Uh, but you don't need to be one of these uh, groups to request a CVE. Uh, this is uh, open to anyone. Uh, if you're a FOSS project um, and you have a CNA, go through them first uh, or make sure you have a CNA or not. Uh, but otherwise, you can still request directly um, to MITRE. So when you're assigning CVEs, there's um, a few key pieces of information. Um, the, the most uh, important or widely read uh, is the description. And the description should always contain an explanation of the attack uh, using the vulnerability, uh, the impact of the vulnerability, uh, what software is affected, and other relevant attack vectors that uh, the vulnerability can use. The CVE also includes the severity score as calculated uh, by uh, CVSS. And uh, you want to include all existing references to the vulnerability. Uh, researchers often include disclosure reports, bug reports, and distribution announcements. Also included is um, the CWE. Um, all of these pieces of information can be updated later, uh, but it's best if you can get it right the first time because um, others will download that information and it's better if it's not changed. Um, not all CVEs are valid. Um, if you request a CVE, make sure that it's a real vulnerability, um, something that really impacts security and not something that's just simply a bug. Uh, this is an example of a misassigned CVE uh, for the version control software Git. Uh, in this case, the researcher thought there was a vulnerability in Git, and they contacted Git security. Git security uh, told them that there was no vulnerability, and the feature that they thought uh, had an issue was working um, as intended. Um, but they assigned a CVE anyways. Um, the researcher was able to write a blog post, uh, but this causes a lot of headache for developers and downstream maintainers who now need to deal with this misassigned CVE. Uh, this is another example of an upstream developer disputing a vulnerability. InfluxDB documents that their database should not be run publicly without an authentication layer. If a server administrator runs a database publicly without authentication, the administrator is responsible for the break in security, not the InfluxDB developers. Uh, it's always wise to talk to the upstream developers before signing a CVE. Um, and as FOSS developers, you should make it very clear what you consider a vulnerability and what you don't consider a vulnerability um, to head off this miscommunication. Uh, sometimes CVEs are assigned to the wrong project. Uh, in this case, um, there was a vulnerability in Node SQL 3 uh, that was assigned to upstream. Uh, and uh, finally, um, this is a bug in the Xorg uh, Windows Manager. Um, and it was uh, found that there wasn't actually a security component uh, to this bug, so the CVE uh, was later rejected by the CNA who s assigned it. Um, but CVEs are extremely useful, even if they are sometimes misassigned. 
Uh, they're the primary source that most organizations use to uh, track the security of packages. Uh, if there's a vulnerability in your project, you want to see the assigned to it so that others are aware that your software needs to be patched. Um, vulnerability disclosure is a very large topic. Um, so let's say there's a researcher who finds a vulnerability in your project. Um, how are you going to tell others about that secret? The researcher who found the vulnerability uh, could write a blog post and put it on the internet uh, before a patch is out. Uh, that type of disclosure is called um, uh, a zero day or uh, full disclosure. So if you, if you post a zero day online, that is full disclosure without a patch. Um, or you might uh, patch the vulnerability and ask the researcher not to tell anyone. Uh, sweeping, sweeping vulnerabilities under the rug is called private disclosure. Uh, both of these uh, paths or both of these options put users at risk. The middle ground is coordinated vulnerability disclosure or CVD. Uh, typically a research in a project will agree to a coordinated release date or CRD uh, on when to announce the vulnerabilities uh, such as 90 days. Uh, during this time, the vulnerability is under embargo, and anyone working on the vulnerability is not supposed to speak about it publicly. Coordinated vulnerability disclosures give upstream the opportunity to investigate and prepare the patch, and for upstream to coordinate the patch with downstream projects. Using CVD as your vulnerability disclosure model protects users since Multiple affected parties can release a patch on the same day. Um, if you're interested in this, I really recommend a talk called Preparing for Zero Day by the Open Source Security Foundation or Open SSF. Or Open SSF. Um, if you download this slideshow, uh, there's a resources slide at the very end uh, with a lot of links, including to this video. So, and, uh, so security maintenance is a reactive approach to security. As Ubuntu security engineers, uh, my team is not an expert in the code base of every package we maintain. We rely on upstream uh, to create security patches, which we then apply. Uh, our duty is to close vulnerabilities, first and foremost. Uh, we track vulnerabilities and packages that Ubuntu supports, uh, coordinate with upstream, apply available patches, and backport patches. So what is the process of maintaining the security of packages in Ubuntu? So um, how many have heard of Ubuntu Pro? And how many are using it? Um, so Ubuntu Pro um, extends the security maintenance of Ubuntu LTS releases uh, to 10 years. Um, it's free to individuals and small uh, businesses up to five licenses and community members uh, get 50 licenses if they sign up with their community email. Uh, this extended maintenance means there is a tremendous amount of CVEs uh, for the Ubuntu security team to patch. So our first step is uh, initial triage. Um, uh, the Ubuntu security team monitors many sources for new CVEs, and each week we go through hundreds of new CVE reports. Uh, we first determine uh, if the CVE affects Ubuntu packages, and we generate a report for tracking the CVE if they do. Our main goal at this step is to assess the severity of a vulnerability and determine our response. Uh, then we begin patching. Uh, when we patch, we do more research uh, that's specific to the vulnerability. Uh, we read through the vulnerability's bug reports to learn more and examine how the patch works. We'll look for red flags like, does this patch cause a regression that requires a second patch? Uh, after research, we will take the patch and apply it to packages. Uh, if the package doesn't apply to an older version, we'll attempt a backport. Uh, the Ubuntu security team, uh, or Ubuntu security patches land in a special app repository uh, just for security updates called the security pocket. When we make an update, we, we annotate each patch to communicate which CVEs are fixed 
in a case the patch series needs to be changed later. Uh, testing is probably the most critical step. Uh, we compare the build logs of a patched and unpatched uh, package and run other tools to look for regressions. Uh, we then test the package uh, we built locally, and then we retest uh, the package built through Launchpad. Uh, when possible, we uh, test that we can reproduce the vulnerability in the unpatched package, and that the patch package is no longer vulnerable. Uh, we do all these steps for each Ubuntu release of a package that is vulnerable. So uh, if we patch a package in Xenial, Bionic, Focal, and Jammy, we'll do all these steps four times. Uh, when a package is patched and ready for release, uh, we'll publish it to the Ubuntu Security Archive, uh, and uh, we will then email out um, a security announcement to our listserv uh, that we call an Ubuntu uh, Security Notice, or USN. And then our USN email is republished to the Ubuntu website and various third parties. Uh, finally, we monitor the launchpad uh, bugs for the package in case any other issues crop up for the package we release. So, uh, a big takeaway that I have for this talk is, talk is it's okay not to be perfect. Uh, admitting that you found a bug in your software is okay. And if a vulnerability is found in your project, it is okay to disclose it. Some projects feel ashamed or reluctant or just plain don't care to admit the vulnerabilities were found in their code. Uh, but do not sweep vulnerabilities under the rug. The maturity to disclose vulnerabilities is a sign that a FOSS project takes security seriously. Vim is a popular text editor that many programmers and writers use. The author of Vim, Bram Moulinier, has been running a bug bounty since 2001. Over 130 bugs uh, have been found through this bug bounty, and roughly half have been assigned CVEs. Bram is doing a tremendous job of protecting his users by owning and addressing these issues. On the other hand, uh, some projects do not assign CVEs or warn others about vulnerabilities in their code. Kitty is a feature-rich terminal emulator, uh, which I used until recently. Uh, because Kitty does not assign uh, or report vulnerabilities, I, as a package maintainer, do not know when security issues are needed to patch it. Some of these vulnerabilities are quite serious. And at the end of the day, users pay the consequences for Kitty's security policy. So be like Brom, own your bugs, own your vulnerabilities, fix them, and protect your users. The other takeaway I have is to write a security policy. The main goal of a security policy is to tell vulnerability discoverers how to contact you. Often a file is named uh, security, like security.md or security.txt. Uh, and um, if you create one of these files on GitHub, it will populate uh, the security tab. Uh, the Open Source Security Foundation, uh, OpenSSF, publishes concise guides, which are an excellent resource for learning uh, security policy best practices. Their GitHub repo contains Example, uh, an example security MD template for FOSS projects to use. Uh, in this example, uh, their security policy explains how researchers can report to them. It clearly describes their expectation of and commitments to the researcher and sets a coordinated release uh, disclosure timeline. Uh, LXD is another a great example of a security policy. Um, this security policy contains an overview of uh, the application security and links to in-depth documentation for users. They also describe uh, what they do and do not consider a vulnerability according to their threat model. There is a link uh, to an in-depth uh, video on LXD security by the developer Stefan Graber uh, in the resources section of this slideshow. So please write a security policy. Um, communication 
is extremely important uh, as a FOSS project. Um, if a researcher finds a vulnerability in your project, uh, work with them as much as possible. Um, often FOSS projects will receive a report and go dark and not speak to them for a while. Um, the researcher likely knows the code base um, of your project very well, and they can help solve problems of the vulnerability. Uh, researchers are especially helpful at testing your patch. You might patch the vulnerability and think it's fixed, but the security researcher might find other ways around the patch. The first place most organizations learn about a vulnerability is through the CVE description. As a developer, you understand your code and likely the nature of the vulnerability well. So instead of having a third party write the CVE and the description for you, get involved in the process uh, and head off miscommunication. Writing a bug report for the vulnerability is also helpful, especially if you're doing a coordinated release disclosure to time the release of the bug report uh, with public announcement. And people who later uh, read the patches will go back to the bug report and learn a lot from the bug report. Depending on the severity of the vulnerability, you may want to announce the disclosure on a mailing list or on your website. And chain lo change logs or re release notes should always mention vulnerabilities uh, fixed between versions. Writing security patches for maintenance will help downstream projects. This is part of a security patch for Vim. Um, it clearly describes the problem and solution in the description of the, of the git commit. So anyone going back through this um, will be really grateful. Uh, Brahm even does a nice job of formatting the description. Um, if you have a CVE number, uh, putting the CVE number in this description is really helpful because then others can search through your Git log or uh, version control log. This is the same patch. Uh, the patch is very specific. It um, addresses the vulnerability and it doesn't change other code uh, that isn't related to the vulnerability. Uh, generally, refactoring code or making style changes makes the Git log messy uh, and uh, creates a lot of extra work for patch maintainers. Um, and Brom goes above and beyond by even including uh, a test case or reproducer for the vulnerability so that when you apply this patch, you can test that it's actually fixed. You may want to look for vulnerabilities yourself. This can uh, reduce the burden of vulnerabilities because it's not someone telling you and then you having to reactively address it. Uh, static analyzers are tools which look for vulnerabilities in code. Um, there are many types of, there are many types of static analyzers for different types of, uh, for different tasks and languages. Fuzzers test how programs respond often to invalid or random input. And um, there's a list of static analyzers as well as uh, fuzzers in the resources section of the slideshow. Uh, bug bounties are well known, but you should only do this last. Um, it's better to vet your own software first. Um, otherwise, you might get a lot of reports that you're not able to keep up with, especially if you have a cash incentive for discoveries. So um, others can get involved uh, in the security process as well. Um, it's expected and the responsibility of FOSS projects to address vulnerabilities, uh, but this adds a lot of burden to FOSS projects. Um, if you want to get involved, you can run static analyzers or fuzzers on projects. Um, reading the audit logs and taking action is a huge amount of work and um, project maintainers will be grateful uh, for security contributions. If that sounds interesting, you may want to first try automating covariety uh, scans 
Uh, you can do that with GitHub actions or other source control actions. Um, or you could learn about OSS fuzz. Uh, triaging new security related bug reports is also helpful. Uh, sometimes security bugs will remain open for months or years. FOSS projects also need help writing security policies. You may want to open a work in project pull request uh, and then work with the maintainer to expand it. Uh, you might not know the specific email they want to use. And to recap, um, it's okay to, dis uh, to disclose vulnerabilities, write a security policy, uh, communicate well, especially with the researcher and anyone affected, and if you can, patch for maintenance. Um, if this is interesting to you, uh, Canonical is hiring uh, for uh, security maintenance. Uh, we have multiple security engineer roles open, and we're also hiring managers. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, please find me after the talk or uh, message me. Um, and I'd just like to quickly thank the Ubuntu security team uh, for reviewing this talk, and to Maru and Rex for sponsoring me. And uh, first, and the OpenFSS and Mitri for uh, taking my questions. Uh, if you're a FOSS project and you would like help, reach out to FIRST and OpenFFS. Um, they're, they're great. Um, I'd like to give a huge thank you to Yang Bin. I was having problems in the airport, and I think he was helping me out at like 2, 3 a.m. Uh, and to everyone else at Ukwakan community. So uh, thank you. Uh, if there's time, I can take questions. Yes. Improving reproducibility upstream, or if Canonical is involved in that effort in any way? Uh, yeah, yes, we do. So, um, before packages are allowed into the main repository of um, the Ubuntu archive, uh, they go through um, a review process. Um, and uh, a key component of that auditing is to make sure that there are auto package tests. So, um, Whenever the package is built on Launchpad, it goes through a series of tests to, to do what you're talking about. Um, packages in Universe um, don't always have these auto package tests. And with Ubuntu Pro, there's many more packages that, that don't have this. Um, but that's something that can be addressed. And um, yeah, uh, the auto package tests can be expanded primarily through Debian. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned in your talk that uh, the security updates, they come through like a different uh, repository uh, than the mainstream uh, updates uh, for Ubuntu. Um, what do you think about like the, the pros and cons of that approach versus other operating systems that tend to uh, put all the updates together in one uh, single stream? Mm, uh, can you can you restate that? Yeah. So uh, you mentioned like Ubuntu uh, when like you make a security update, there's a separate repository mm. that those updates come through. Um, but other operating systems, for example, Windows, if you get the security updates, it comes with everything. Um, w can you speak like from your side of things, uh, developing like patches, uh, what the pros and cons of each approach are, is, and which one you prefer? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, when we make security patches, we have a special repository called the Security Pocket, um, which, um, which should be enabled if you're running Ubuntu, um, but you could choose not to. Um, that is likely for um, very specific organizations who um, are worried about um, their software acting slightly differently. Um, if when a package gets updated, um, like a, a release update, 
those would include security updates. Um, so it, it, it's, I don't know, for me it feels like it's more control over whether you want that or not. I would always do it, I'd recommend it. Um, there was another question up front. Well, thank you.